I'm Lisa Eby. I joined the Navy on October the 13th, 1981, and served through October the 11th, 1985. I turned 24 in boot camp. So I was older than most of the recruits that were in my company. I think I was quiet. Um, I'm much more of an extrovert now. Um, I believe the Navy brought that out in me. I come from a very poor family and uh, we didn't have a lot growing up. And so when I joined the Navy, I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself and the chiefs and the senior chiefs that I worked for brought that out in me and let me know that I could do stuff and I was smart. Uh, my uncle, uh, Uncle Jack, was in World War II and he married uh, my namesake, Aunt Lisa, who was German, and she saved him in World War II. And so I was named after them, after her, when, she, when, I, when they came back to the States. So that's the extent of the military people that are in my family. Okay, and you said you grew up in, in Mississippi? Yes. Um, just outside of? So we're about uh, 60 miles or so from New Orleans, just on the state line, inland from uh, Bay St. Louis, Waveland, about 30 miles. It was like any southern s small town, you know, uh, you knew pretty much everybody. My family on my mother's side and my father's side are quite large. They each had 11 sisters and brothers. So all of my family is from Picayune. And, um, and most of them are still there. I, I'm next to the oldest of five children in my immediate family. So it's just, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Just small town, you know, everybody doing their own thing, trying to make a living. Um, we were poor, but I think we were basically happy. So I didn't graduate. I went back and got my GED. I got married the first time at a very young age. And so, um, which that marriage did not last. We were both too young. And so the military was a way for me to uh, make better of myself, to have some kind of future that I didn't see in our small town. I was working um, three jobs, not making ends meet, and I had went to New Orleans to look for a job, and I had made the offhand statement that if I didn't find a job in New Orleans, that I was just gonna join the military. So, of course, I didn't find a job. <laughs> and so I came back, and um, the Navy recruiter didn't actively recruit women and he said that he would process me with the other, I don't know, 15 or so men that he were, was processing at the time. And um, that's the end of that story. <laughs> I thought about the Air Force and um, I've suffered with motion sickness all my life, so my family thought it was really funny that I would join the Navy. <laughs> I actually love the water. I love boats. I love being out. Uh, my body just doesn't like it very well. <laughs> so uh, I joined. So I, like I said, I joined the Navy on the Navy's birthday, and so was sworn in on October the 13th in in New Orleans, and then immediately sent to. Orlando, and when I got there, I thought, what have I done? That was a scary realization that I might have messed up. <laughs> now, we had uh, two company commanders, and uh, one of them was um, uh, a very athletic little woman, and so we didn't, we didn't march anywhere. We basically ran. We double timed everywhere we went. So I was an SK, uh, which is a logistics supply person. So I went, um, so I graduated boot camp and I got promoted in boot camp from a seaman to a seaman apprentice. Oh, excuse me, from a seaman recruit to a seaman apprentice. And then I went to A school, which was back in Mississippi. And, um, and then from there, um, I mean, I went through that school pretty quick. It only took me like two or three weeks to go through those training classes and then I went to my first command. And they start looking for where they want to send you. 
when you're in A school. So um, that was the time when they first started putting women on ships. And so there were a couple of options and they said, well, we can send you to Kings Bay, Georgia to the USS Simon Lake. And I was like, well, where is that? Oh, it's just north of Jacksonville. So I was like, I'm very green. I'm older than all the other girls, but I'm very green. I have not been outside of my little bubble very much, so I was not worldly. I was like, okay, that sounds fine, so that's where I went. It's as far south in the state of Georgia and as far east as you can go without being in Florida or the Atlantic Ocean. So just that little corner there. Well, I was really nervous when I pulled up to the gate. So Kings Bay used to be an army depot and it had been converted in the late 70s. The Navy took it over because they were gonna build a submarine base. But at the time that I got there, there was nothing but the front gate and five miles of woods to where the ship was docked. So the ship, <laughs> reporting on board the ship, there was about, I would say 1,200 men and about 50 women. So I was one of the very first women mm -hmm. to be stationed on that ship. So how was the experience of being one of the very first women on the, on the ship? So the younger guys, they liked it. They, you know, if you ever are in that area, you realize there really wasn't anything there at Kings Bay. There was a, wasn't a lot to do. If you wanted to do anything, you had to go to Jacksonville. And so they were happy but some of the older, saltier sailors uh, didn't like it so much. They, they thought that it wasn't a good thing to have women on board and that the Navy had messed up by putting them. And they weren't afraid to voice that in many, including vulgar ways, as you walk down the passageway. My, my raid as an SK was one of the oldest raids in the Navy. And in the last few years, they changed that rate from SK to LS. And um, one of the master chiefs that I am friends with, that I actually worked for for a minute on the ship before he transferred, he was very, very upset. And they had petitioned not to change that. But, you know, they moved with the times and changed it to logistics instead of an SK as a storekeeper. I'm a little sad, I guess, that they changed that rate to be an LS. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a movement uh, a while back to even change the way we manage stock. And, and in the Navy, you have, you know, um, Navy stock numbers, which is made up of a series of numbers. And they wanted to change those numbering system to make it easier for people because people didn't understand how those numbers worked. And I was like, it's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really think they got traction on changing that within the Navy, but they were trying. They were trying. I spent uh, just over two years on that ship, and then I went to, um, to the sub base and spent the remainder of my tour there, and I worked um, in the warehouse. So um, there was a couple. And what, what sub base was that? Kings Bay. Oh, in Kings Bay, Southeast. King Kings okay. Bay. I didn't okay. leave. So you never left. You just did, you just transferred to a different unit. So I just speak. yes, I just transferred to the sub base and uh, and I um, I made well I made third class my first time up on the ship and when I transferred uh, to the base and I took the second class exam I made second class which is E5 um, first time up so. I, I was kind of, I was moving up pretty good. When I made second class, I was really, really nervous. And uh, the master chief I worked for the day that the results were out came in and said to me, well, when you take first class, you're gonna, well, he, he said, how did he put it? When you're just gonna have to try harder. And I was like, oh, I didn't make it. He said, well, when you take first class, it's harder. I was like, oh. <laughs> So he was just giving me a hard time about it. It was a very a tough decision not to re-enlist, but my husband had gotten a job locally and he, at the paper mill and he was making, he was one of three machinists there at the paper mill because that's what he did in the Navy as he was a, an MR. 
and uh, we had built a house and uh, we had had a baby in the middle of that and so I wanted to re-enlist and they said that if I re-enlisted it I could go to the Canopus which was uh, stationed there the Simon Lake had left and the USS Canopus was there and um, but that was only going to be for a short period and where I would land next was not certain and my husband and I discussed it and decided that it was probably best if I just got out of the Navy uh, and we would just stay right there at Kings Bay. He was one of those 1200 men <laughs> and you can say he either got lucky or maybe not so lucky but he's had me uh, for 39 years we've been married 38 so <laughs> maybe it was luck um, I actually had seen him on the ship but had not uh, really spoken to him so I uh, he was roommates with one of the other women's uh, boyfriends and I had taken her over there and that's how I actually met him it's a little different today if you're prior service, but back then if you were post-Vietnam era, you didn't get any kind of privileges, head of the line privileges. So I took an exam just like everybody else that wanted to be civil servant. And then I got picked up about, I don't know, about four months after I got out of the Navy. I got picked up uh, as, as a kind of a training program to start with and then picked up full time um, on the Navy base. And so they knew me because I had actually filled in and helped them as a military person when they were shorthanded of civilians. So it was a pretty easy transition for me to ease myself back into that. Well, on the ship, I worked stock control, and then I uh, worked the warehouse when I was at sub-base. And when I got picked back up as a civilian, I, I went to work in supply. And I worked in supply for like the first two and a half, three years maybe, because I worked at sub-base, and then I went to the Trident Refit Facility. And then I got picked up in the planning department. And so the rest of my career was in planning and plans and programs, maintenance management kind of stuff. The, the Trident submarines were coming online and they were coming out of the yard. And um, they are East Coast, West Coast. So East Coast, was, their ships were at Kings Bay and West Coast, were, they were out in Washington. And so um, as they were coming out of the yard and coming to Kings Bay, they were building up Kings Bay. So they were building up the, tr the Trident refit facility and where the ship I was on did all the maintenance on the subs when they came in. For the Tridents, they built the base and all the maintenance that had to be done on those uh, when they would come in for, as we call, refits, then any preventive maintenance, any corrective maintenance, any alterations, all that kind of stuff would get done there. So. Myself and one other person originally would schedule all the preventive maintenance. So we would do all of that. And then I kind of moved up and did forecasting for a while. We had forecast workload for the shops. And, and then I left the refit facility and went across the base and worked at the strategic weapons facility. And there I was uh, the D5 missile planner. So I was uh, making decisions on what missiles needed to go come off the ships and what needed to be recertified and uh, if there was any issues, all of that planning stuff that went into that. And I also was the US-UK liaison for the D5 missile program. So I worked with the UK on their, they owned four boats and they would come over across the pond for two reasons. One, to offload and come back when they come out of the yard and reload and and certify the boat in the crew so that's what I did for that and then I did a short tour in um, Jacksonville with Navy Medicine as a program manager and I did a short tour with the Marines in Albany Georgia as a project manager and then I came back as the division head for the maintenance management division in the planning program I spent um, civilian I spent 28 and a half years as a civilian and four years as active duty. So I had 32 and a half years. Oh. 
and I love the Navy. I believe the Navy is directly responsible for who I am today. When I joined the Navy, I did not have a lot of confidence in myself. So I didn't know what I was capable of. So I don't know that I had the foresight to think that far ahead. I was looking for a way to make a living and to make something out of myself. I come to realize that it's the people that you work with and the people that train you and the people that help you that help you get up that. Now you've got to prove yourself. You know, as you climb that ladder, you've got to show that you're capable of doing that, but you, nobody gets anywhere by themselves. People that think that are really just fooling themselves because it's the people that build you up, make you believe that you can, train you as you're going, guide you, that help you along that path. When we got married in 1983, uh, his fa he's from northern Indiana, and his dad was a detective in Fort Wayne. And the plan was that we would, when my uh, tour of duty was up, we would move to Indiana. Well, in the meantime, his dad retired in 84, the year after, and they moved to Inglewood. So we've been coming down here for a long time. And um, in 2010, we came down and fell in love with Ponte Gorda. And so his dad was moving into Emerald Point and we was like, oh, well maybe we will retire. <laughs> so that's the first time retirement was put on the radar as something that we would do and that we might would move here. Um, and then you ended up moving here. And then we ended up moving here. We, um, he, he worked for a bank. He was um, a loan officer um, and he took a job down here the month before I retired, I retired in the May of 2014. We moved down. Oh, when we got down here, um, it is great, but I needed something to do. And so I was like, you know, um, there's an assistant job open with the county. I think I can do that. I've never been an assistant, but I know how to do all that kind of stuff. So I applied and luckily got picked up. The number of people that serve or have served in the military in some form or fashion are really a very, very tiny portion of the citizens of this great nation. So I don't know that, uh, that everyone truly understands the sacrifices that are made by those people that fought and died or those people that fought and came back and are never the same. Um, without this to show what sacrifices, it is so important that, that we as a people understand what it takes to be free because freedom is not free. Somebody paid that price for you uh, to maintain your freedom and it is important that we do that. The sacrifices that were made on their behalf, and their children's behalf, and their grandchildren's behalf. Would I join the military? By all means. I love our nation. I love the military. I, I, like I said earlier, I would not be who I am today without that.